In this final video of the lecture, I will be explaining in a bit more detail the inductive style of reasoning. So the first thing to note is that um, as I stressed in the previous parts of this lecture, many inductive arguments are invalid. They do not logically guarantee their conclusion. But nonetheless, you can have uh, two inductive arguments uh, where one is better than the other. So the notion of an inductively good argument is one that's graded. That is to say that inductive arguments are better or worse. That is in contrast with the notion of deductive arguments where an argument is either valid or not. It's an all or nothing thing. It doesn't make sense to say whether an argument is more or less valid. It either is or it isn't. Either the premises guarantee the conclusion or they do not. But with this notion of inductive arguments, we can talk of uh, inductive arguments being better than others. That is to say, inductive arguments being more or less strong. So in order to make sense of this, compare the following two inductive generalizations. So the first is as follows. My premise is that every morning so far that I have observed, the sun has risen. So every morning of my life, the sun has risen. And I conclude from that, that the sun will continue to rise every morning. So I conclude that, for instance, tomorrow, I expect the sun to rise as well. Now, Note again that this argument is not deductively valid. It's possible, it's logically possible that tomorrow when I wake up, the sun, for instance, burns out or disappears. That is a logical possibility. But nonetheless, this argument is a pretty strong argument. The fact that every morning I have observed the sun rising is really strong basis for concluding that uh, tomorrow morning and every morning after that in my life, the sun will rise. So this argument is invalid, but it's very, very strong. It's a very good argument. But now compare this with the, this, the following argument. Pre my premise for this one is, I woke up this morning with a headache. And I conclude that every morning for the rest of my life, I will also wake up with a headache. Now this should strike you as pretty bad reasoning, but what I'm trying to illustrate to, to you is that both of these arguments here are, from the perspective of deductive logic, uh, invalid. So both of these arguments are equally invalid. They're deductively in invalid. Yet, one of these arguments is much better inductively than the other, concluding from the fact that every time I've woken up, the sun has risen, uh, concluding from that, that the sun will continue to rise, is very good reasoning. Whereas if this one morning I wake up uh, with a headache and then I immediately conclude that every other morning this headache will persist, that is very bad reasoning. Um, so the notion of in, uh, good inductive reasoning is one that's graded in the sense that arguments can be more or less strong in the inductive sense, even though the two arguments are, say, deductively invalid. So here's another uh, two arguments to compare to this effect. So premise one, either it's raining or it's snowing, uh, therefore it's raining. So if we were to translate this into our formal language and create a joint truth table, we would see that this argument is not deductively valid. That is possible for it to be true that either it's raining or snowing, but not be true that it's raining. So this argument is not deductively valid, but now let's compare that with the second argument. Either it's raining or it's not raining, therefore it's raining. So this again uh, is deductively um, invalid. So just because it's either raining or it's not doesn't guarantee that it's raining. However, 
when we compare these two arguments, there's a sense in which this first argument is better than the second one. If I know it's either raining or snowing, then that makes it kind of likely that it's raining, as opposed to, for instance, um, that it's sunny outside. But now, in the second argument, if all I know is that either it's raining or it's not, then I don't really know anything, because no matter what, it's always raining or it's not. So that really doesn't make it likely. That, really, that The idea that you knowing that it's either raining or it's not raining doesn't really make it particularly likely that it's raining. So here again, we have two in, uh, invalid arguments uh, where one of them is actually better than the other and is better in, uh, in an inductive sense, in a probabilistic sense, in the sense that either it's raining or snowing makes it probable that it's raining in a way that either it's raining or it's not raining does not make it probable that it's raining. So hopefully you can see intuitively that this first argument is a bit better than the second argument. But that is something which we cannot capture with deductive logic. And so that's why we will be developing uh, inductive logic or probability theory. So here, finally, is a, is a, is a final example uh, of an invalid argument. Uh, but that seems like very good reasoning. So we've already seen a bunch of examples so far in this. So with this argument here in this lecture, in this, sorry, in this video, this argument here, that's another example of a good argument that's not valid. And in, in the previous video, we also saw a bunch of examples as well. Now here is a more complex example that should also, uh, that I'll be giving you finally to really drive this point home about uh, what it means for an argument to be good, but not uh, valid. So imagine you are a jury member in a murder trial where someone Jones has been killed. Now, the one on trial, Smith, has actually confessed to killing Jones, to committing this murder. Furthermore, a witness, Dr. Zed, signed a statement to the effect that he saw Smith shoot Jones. And furthermore, a large number of witnesses heard Jones gasp with his dying breath. Smith did it. So you conclude that Smith killed Jones. Now this seems like a very, very good line of reasoning. It seems like you, you would be, it would be very strange for you to not conclude that Smith is the murderer. But, as with the examples above, this line of reasoning, this argument from the premises about what Smith has confessed to, what this witness, what this uh, witness, Dr. Z, has uh, said, what these other witnesses have said, with those as your premises, to conclude that Smith actually did it is not deductively valid. Now, why is that? Well, let's try to actually imagine uh, scenario in which that shows how this argument is invalid. So I want you to suppose that Smith was insane and that he confessed to every murder he ever heard of, but that this fact was generally unknown because he had just moved into the neighborhood. Um, this, this peculiarity was, however, known to Dr. Zed, who was Jones's psychiatrist. So and for his own malevolent reasons, Dr. Zed, Dr. Zed decided to eliminate Jones and frame Smith. He convinced Jones that under, hypno under hypnosis that Smith was a, a homicidal maniac bent on killing Jones. So that's why uh, Jones, in his, dying, in his dying breath, said that Smith did it because he was uh, hyp hypnotized into thinking that Smith uh, must have done it by this Dr. Zed. And then, but finally, the reason why Jones was killed was that actually Dr. Zed shot him from behind a, pot, a potted plant and fled the scene of the crime. So no one uh, saw Dr. Zed, Dr. Zed do it. So this very far-fetched scenario is one which explains how all these premises, so to speak, can be true. It explains how 
uh, Smith confessed to killing Jones. He did because he was insane and he just says yes whenever he's asked about any murder. It explains why Dr. Zed signed the statement because Dr. Zed actually committed the murder but was framing Smith. And Dr. Zed hypnotized Jones into thinking it must have been Smith, so that's why uh, Jones gasped with his dying breath that Smith did it. Um, and then again, Dr. Zed was when he shot Jones, that's why Jones was murdered. Um, so all of these premises, all of this evidence is true, but it's not true in this scenario, this far-fetched scenario, it's not true that Smith actually killed Jones. In fact, Dr. Zed was the one who did it. So despite that, this line of reasoning here is very, very good. In fact, you can't imagine really concluding otherwise. It's invalid as this far-fetched scenario shows. But what you have to notice is that this scenario here where Dr. Zed framed Smith. That scenario is highly improbable, but it's still possible, and that's why, as a matter of deductive logic, the argument is invalid. So it's a logical possibility, but it's highly improbable. And it's really because scenarios like this are highly improbable that the argument on the previous slide, the concluding from all the evidence, is inductively good. So what it means for an argument to be inductively good is connected with the notion of probability. And so in this unit, we will be developing a formal theory of probability. So now I want to give you a general, uh, kind of a rough account of what it means for an argument to be inductively strong. Now, we, won't be, we'll, we will only return to filling this out in more rigorous detail after we've developed the formal tools. But uh, before diving into the formal tools, I'll give you the kind of intuitive general account of inductive strength. Now, an argument is strong uh, according to the inductive strength, uh, just in case, assuming that the premises are all true, the conclusion is made probably true. That is to say that these, these premises, the truth of the premises, uh, makes the conclusion likely. So that is really the core idea for what it means to say an argument is inductively strong. So this idea probably will unpack with formal tools, but it's important to note that it's very natural to talk of statements or propositions being more or less probable than others. And similarly, uh, we can say that one argument might be inductively stronger than another uh, because its premises make its conclusion much more probable than the other's premises make its conclusion. So just as we talk about statements being more or less probable, we can talk about uh, different inductive arguments being more or less strong in terms of how probable, to what degree the premises make the conclusion probable. Uh, so just to sum, uh, sum, summarize, an argument is strong or inductively strong to the degree that its premises make its conclusion probable. Now, as I just said a moment ago, we're going to be giving a much more precise account of this uh, in a couple weeks after we have developed a more systematic way of talking about probability. Now, in the reading for today, there is a rough and ready guide uh, to using probabilities to assess evidence for a hypothesis. So where we can talk about uh, whether an evidence supports a hypothesis, that's the same as talking about uh, whether a premise supports a conclusion. So the evidence is like a premise and the hypothesis is like a conclusion. So here's another kind of uh, general intuitive way of thinking about in, uh, inductive strength or good probabilistic arguments. And I'll quickly just talk about that way from the readings. So the guide which the readings give you is that to determine whether evidence uh, supports a, a hypothesis, 
you ask, is the evidence more likely, given the assumption that the hypothesis is true, or given that it's false? That is, if you find a piece of evidence, and you wonder whether, uh, how much it supports a certain hypothesis, what you ask is how likely that hypothesis makes that evidence. So given that hypothesis, how much would you expect that evidence to hold? And if the hypothesis in question makes the evidence more likely, uh, then the falsity of the hypothesis would make the evidence. Then you can uh, infer as a guide that the evidence uh, is good evidence for the hypothesis. And now we can also introduce, uh, we can see uh, as a beginning the formal notation which we'll use in doing probability theory. So this, the question the guide asks us is whether the probability of E given H, so whether the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis is greater than the probability of the evidence given the falsity of the, of the hypothesis. So you should recognize uh, the E and the H from the last unit. So these are uh, atomic sentence letters. And here we have the negation, uh, not H. And we will see furthermore that any, any complicated sentences, so E and H, uh, E or H, etc., can be fed in to the uh, probability operator. And this probability operator, in this case, PR, takes two propositions and outputs a number. So the probability of E given H is a number. And we can ask whether that number, the probability of E given H, is greater uh, than the probability of E given not H. So again, we'll see this a lot in a lot more detail starting next week. Um, and that is to say that in, uh, in this unit, starting next week, we're going to unpack this formalism and we'll ultimately give a full account of what it means for an argument to be inductively strong, as I've said on this slide. But what you can also keep in mind from the, the reading for today is that there's also a kind of rough and ready guide for thinking about evidence and hypotheses as well. Now, okay, wrapping up. So as we saw in the very first part of this lecture, mathematics relies on proofs, and proofs are deductive arguments. And I kind of quickly went over an example of a mathematical proof. But in all other sciences, humanities, and most day-to-day -day reasoning, uh, there is uncertainty about what's true. So when we're reasoning about mathematics, there really isn't uncertainty about the things we're appealing to. But in basically most all other types of reasoning throughout the, again, throughout the sciences and the humanities and in our day-to-day -day lives, we're often very uncertain about whether the things we're reasoning with are true. And so for, for that reason, we have to think about probabilities and inductive logic. So for instance, uh, in the sciences, and the humanities, no matter how many times a theory is tested and verified, there's a chance, however slim, that the exception has yet to be discovered. So in mathematics, when we talk about whether, for instance, the square root of two is a, uh, irrational, that's not really something that we could find a counterexample to or we could discover is false. But in empirical theories, we see in the other sciences, um, those are claims about the world, which we have a bunch of evidence for, and we have, therefore, we have very, very good arguments for them. But there is still always a certain amount of uncertainty. And we could always, for instance, find evidence that was a problem for that theory. But, so that is to say that the way in which we confirm empirical theories is not deductively valid. But, as I've been stressing to you, in, the, in this introduction to induction and probability theory, even if an argument isn't valid, even if there's some chance the conclusion is false, if the premises are true, it can still be a very, very good argument. So think again about the chain of reasoning that we made as jurors uh, on the trial of Smith. This is an incredibly good chain of reasoning, even though 
there are far-fetched possibilities which show that it's not deductively valid. So, even though we have to apply induction and probabilities to understand reasoning in most aspects of our lives, uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't very, very good arguments and very, very well-established conclusions. So, finally, to reiterate, because inductive strength depends on probability, inductive logic involves a careful study of probability, and that is what we will do in this unit.